And I'm also delighted to um, um, introduce to you Robert Wilkinson, who is representing another community archive that's quite contrasting. Um, rather than the rural Ambleside, Ambleside he comes from um, urban northeast London, North and Forest, stuff, yeah. um, but also has been working on the archive for probably almost as many years as Jane on the Ambleside. So, and we have been using this archive as well to contrast with the Ambleside in, in our work. So, thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, we'll just get it uh, set up. Like, which, one, like, which one is yours? Um, the bottom one. Um, like Jane, I'm going to sort of go through and tell it as it, as it is, as it was. Um, I'll talk about um, what we collected, um, how we did it, um, how it's been used, and issues around reuse, uh, which I think are some of which have come out this morning and this afternoon. Um, Waltham Forest Oral History Workshop. Um, there really is a Mr. Jones, the butcher, and C. Jones, um, one of the... One of uh, his daughter was interviewed by us for one of our projects. Um, Waltham Forest is in northeast London, as, uh, if you don't know where it is. Um, we, were, we were a bit more Johnny come lately, I suppose. We were formed in 1983. Um, we started mainly as a group of people from Waltham Forest Social Services Department. I, I worked for Waltham Forest Social Services Department as a, as a community worker. Um, and they didn't know, my managers didn't know what community workers did, um, so I could actually get away with things I don't think you could do today, and including was I, in work time I managed to set up uh, a, a, an adult education class in conjunction with our local museum, um, and we got eight people, mostly social workers and people in social services to start with. We got um, Ken Warpole, um, who was um, involved with Centerprise in Hackney, um, as, as our uh, facilitator, as our tutor. Um, he, his background was community publishing, as, as was Centerprise. And I think what we started off with um, an emphasis on the written word as much as the spoken word. And all those um, experiences of, um, as has been rolled out this morning, which, which relieves me no end, because you think, oh God, what, we, what have we done? We've got these awful recordings that you know, have got hisses and and it sounds like they were done in an electric electricity generating machine. Um, all those sort of things um, we got, as well as everybody else seems to have got um, from the sort of 70s and 80s. Um, we, we used um, um, a Tanberg with a built-in mic. We didn't know what microphones were, you know, even them or even then. Um, so it was very, very difficult uh, to uh, um, record very high quality recordings. Um, um, we were uh, encouraged to, uh, as I say, to, to, to record for, for publication as much as to record for archival purposes. So we started off with the idea of doing books, um, small little, you know, I've got, um, got them here somewhere. Um, this is our first one, Touch a Collar, Never Swallow, Never Catch Fever, um, which is the you had to do that if you saw a fever ambulance. That's, that's, the, that's the, the childhood um, rhyme that um, has obviously gone into the depths of history. Um, we, we recorded um, 15 interviews um, and um, we came up with some amazing stories of, of how people, I mean, because, I mean, as Joanna, Joanna's childhood illnesses, his childhood deaths as well, because all those bacteria and, and viral, you know, diphtheria, <coughs> scarlet fever, all those sort of diseases killed you as, as children, um, and you had fever and isolation hospitals, that's the way of treating it. I mean, there wasn't antibiotics, there wasn't um, those sort of medical interventions. So children and parents did die. Um, so we recorded um, those, put them together, cut and, I mean, everybody mentions... Um, you know, cutting and pasting, you know, cut and paste, but we literally cut and paste because that's the only way we could do it. We hand wrote our notes, um, we, we transcribed hand, hand, hand written. This is, this, is a, this is a transcript, this is what we 
Oh, and a consent form. Um, <laughs> this is what we. Uh, this is how we did it. I mean, we didn't have photocopiers. They didn't. I mean, they, I'm sure they existed, but um, that was the problem. We even printed ourselves. Printed. We had somebody from. Because uh, we had no money. It sounds very much like Jane, but. Um, you know, there was no money around, there was no HLF, there was not even a manpower services committee. Well, there was actually beginning to be MSC schemes, but, but that's how we printed. We got a printer to do that, and we, we, I think we, we typed and printed ourselves. In fact, I remember going one day to, uh, to print, and the actual ink had frozen in the building that uh, we were using. Um, so carrying on with what we did. Oh, and sorry, this before I forget. Um, one of the things was about de- one of the things we picked up was dentistry because the, the dentistry in those days was you had your teeth out. You didn't actually have fillings or anything like that. It, you just had your teeth out, <coughs> and that was where um, it was done. Um, in fact, in in those those top windows there. In fact, my grandmother had her teeth pulled out there. Um, one, one week she went for the bottom set, and the next week she went for this top set. Mm-hmm. Oh, amazing. That, does anybody recognise that building? Yeah. William Morris William Gallery, Morris. as it is now. Yeah. Yeah. So, I don't think William Morris had his teeth pulled out there, but uh, <laughs> certainly my grandmother did. Um, gave me very graphic, um, not that I recorded it long before I found it, oral history. The next project, yeah, talk, Blood and Gore and Blood and Gore, um, was, was, I don't know why we chose um, the meat trade locally, um, but Pig's Head and Peas Pudding, it was 1985, um, and we interviewed, we, we were increasing our interviews, we interviewed 18 people, and our membership had grown to 12, so um, there, was, there was an increasing interest. Um, a lot of, you know, there was a lot of technical things about, you know, what the meat trade was, but there was a lot of thing came out about poverty, um, and I, I don't think, we you know, you understand poverty um, as a sort of concept, but when you actually listen to people talking about what they did or what they didn't do because they were so poor, um, it, it just came out quite naturally. We weren't looking for poverty, it was just hit us in the face that, that working class people in North East London were very, very poor. Um, again, we printed. We were very, very poor as well. Um, and then we, we go on to sort of more, um, well, no blood and gore, bakers. Um, and again, I don't know why we, I mean, I, th- I think we're just looking at trades. And we, we, um, we looked at bakers, and then as a subplot of that, we actually looked at confectioners um, and um, sweet making, which was, a, which was a sort of home, all the family did it. They, they made sweets at home, and then the kids wrapped the, the sweets um, in the back room. Um, <coughs> We dropped to 10 members. I don't know what we did wrong there, but uh, 10 members now. Um, and this, in fact, this is what I held up earlier on, um, an example of an early recording. I mean, I just picked this up at random. I was just digitising it uh, a couple of weeks ago. And I think you can read it quite well. I mean, I won't read that out. But that's the sort of example of, uh, an, I think it was an hour's interview. Um, and there was a subsequent, another hour interview, which we've got no paperwork on. Um, but some of, it, some of this was used, I mean, the, 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 her husband was a butcher, so, and he, he'd already died, so we used a couple of paragraphs talking about her, her husband. Um, but Ivy, Ivy left school at 13, um, and if I can get this to work, no, I'm not doing it that way. I'll, I'll, and this, this I, I've, I've heard this at home, so I don't know how this will play at all, but... I, I'm just giving it as an example of, and where's the mouse go? Enter. Mm. Oh, here it is. A, a, of the quality of recording. I might stop it very quickly if, if you can't hear it. Technology, uh, let's try that. Yeah, one. And I had to apply to my sister. I wanted to get to the bacon high school. But you wouldn't let us get either. I had to stop where I could get enough. Your dad thought that if you went to the high school, then you wouldn't be able to go out to work so quickly. No, because the family would have to keep us there for a certain time. It was 14, 15. So she was meant to ask her at school. She was meant to ask her at school. 
The electricity substation um, interview, um, sadly. Um, you could, could people hear that? Yeah, it was audible, but you've got that buzz, unfortunately. Um, one of our um, projects that... Um, I've got some more to play, actually. Oh, okay. so, yeah, yeah, sadly. <laughs> um, one, of, one of our projects I'm, I'm quite proud of was, was um, something that, um, you know, oral history is, 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 a, is not only about bottom-up, um, uh, increasingly... Um, it's more mixed, but in the, in the 70s and 80s, a lot of it was about bottom-up um, interviewing, interviewing people from, you know, who are largely hidden from history. But but whole incidents, whole, whole events are missing from history as well. Mm -hmm. And this is a sort of working-class um, activity, you know, setting up a strike school, not a free school as, they, as they, the middle class do today, but a strike school. Um, essentially, what what had happened was this. School um, in Walthamstow um, in 1945. All the troops come back. Brave new world. All the things that we were going to do uh, for, for for people. One of the victims, or a number of victims of that, was the fact that um, this school was actually forcibly closed in order to make way for a teacher training college because there was a desperate need for teachers to teach the new new um, the school leaving age was going up to 15, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So the, these parents got very angry and set up their own strike school. There's, there is a little bit of reference to it um, in, in the local paper, but not much. There's only a couple of articles. But, so we, we actually, I think we managed to get one parent, unfortunately, because as, as, as if you've done this, you well know, sometimes you're working against time to record people before they die. And most of, most of, the, people, most of the parents had died, unfortunately. We, we interviewed about seven or eight of the children who went to the strike school. So a bit of hidden history, history hidden from, uh, for many years, we, we revived. And also we worked with four of the, of the women who were actually in the strike school. So they, we, we had, we didn't quite have, we had joint editorial control between us and them. It worked very well. I mean, there, was, there were one or two things that we would have put in which they didn't want put in, but uh, it worked very well um, in general. As I said, uh, there's, um, we, I think we start off very, very thematically, very, very much written, um, wanting to sort of get things, quotes, um, sound bites, if you like, um, equivalent sound bites. But um, what we needed to, I th we soon realised as we were interviewing, what we were missing was, was those sort of life stories, as we now call it. We wouldn't have called it life stories. Um, so we started to, to sort of do longer interviews. We were, we were sort of confined to that. C60, C90 um, recordings. So we, we were sort of often sort of cut off in mid-flow because we weren't looking at the tape. You know, it's very, very difficult to look at a thing going round. I'll play one which, which was cut off in mid-flow in a minute. Um, so we started to do more and more longer, you know, sometimes, often as not, we'd actually have to go back, which is a good thing because you actually start to fill in detail of, of what you've missed, as you always do when you get, do an interview. You, 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 you summarise it and then you go back and ask, the, you know, fill in questions. So that, that was, that's a good side product of actually doing life story interviews. So beginning to get more of, of that than the you know, in and out, quarter and out, well, we never did quarter and hour interviews, maybe an hour interviews and off we go. Um, and as Jonah mentioned about how, you know, the, the sampling, you said in, this morning, about, you know, are, are, it's self-sampling, isn't it? I mean, a, a lot of the interviews are self-referrals, or, or we we'd go, because we, a number of us working, as I said, a number of us working in social services, um, we would go, I'd go into the Home Help Office, and, have, and we're doing a project on um, baking, I mean bakers, do you know anybody who worked in a baker's shop? And they come back, often come back a couple of weeks later with quite, quite some quite old people, some quite frail people who we interviewed as a result of that. The museum as well was another source. And the local paper used to, it's, it's less so now I think, you know, in terms of how the media is, different media have taken over, but the local paper would often would get about five to ten people willing to be interviewed. Um, just, just going on in, in terms of in, um, publications, um, two publications that um, we uh, did on, on individuals, um, 
breaking the rules, I guess, in terms of oral history, because it should be much more collective. Although what we did was interview around people. So we, these were the subjects, but we, with Jenny Hammond, we interviewed both her children. Um, we interviewed her neighbours. Um, she'd already died um, by the time we'd actually got round to publishing. She was 90, I think she was about 90 when we interviewed her. But she was a Labour Party activist. Um, and she'd actually written autobiographical notes, so we, which she gave to us before she died. So we, we produced the book on the basis of the interviews, two lots of interviews. Ken Walpole did one of the interviews, and um, her, her biographical notes. Tom Atkins is, is a, uh, almost single-handed, single because it was over seven hours of recording I did with him, um, including going back to some of the places he'd, we recorded on site, some of the places he'd been. He got polio at the age of three um, and had been seven years in a hospital. Um, I mean, I suppose, I suppose it was, I suppose they didn't think it was cruel, but seven years he was only allowed a fortnightly visit from his parents and his brothers and sisters were never allowed to see him. He, he, what he said, I, I, I would have been a better quote actually, I used to wave to these children on the bank outside the hospital ward and I was told they were my brothers and sisters. He, he spoke to them um, when he was about 10, 11, when he, was, he had scarlet fever and was discharged from hospital for being a risk to the other children. Um, so th those sort of stories, I think, I think they were trying to be kind, that, that, that children, disabled children were put away and it was not good to go and see them. It, it upset them. And I think that was probably the reason why. But I'll, I'll play... Again, I think the, the power transformer is still there, but it's a bit... I had a couple of short, short, short term jobs. And then a father, I went to work in the local factory at the moment. I had a couple of short, Sorry, short, short, short term jobs. And then a father, I went to work in the local factory at the moment. First of all, I went in there was a turning. Right. You want the volume down? Yeah, it's too loud, isn't it? Sorry. Um, oh, it's right, not sorry. for people at the back. Yeah. Thank you. I had a couple of short, short, short term jobs. And then I found that I went to work in the local factory at the moment. First of all, I went in there was a doing turning, rather, rather um, uh, mass produced turning of a very, very um, sex skilled steel nature until finally one graduated that. So I, I, I think that there's an hour the inspector there, but uh, um, this is, uh, you know, this thing about life of people with, 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 with uh, people with a disability, when they go to the work scene, they have got to prove so much to an employer. It's not sufficient to say, it. I suppose it's a surprise to anybody, but uh, obviously we put somebody that uh, has uh, an obvious disability that it takes. Have really got to, to they lay everything on the, on the line, and at the end of the day, they, they will wind up feeling that they've been done a favour, that they've given a chance at all. But it's not been a favour at all because you usually find out you're really paying less than the, than the other person anyway. That, that's an absolutely variable experience. So, I have a local firm, and that was what the national was. Yep, yep. The, they changed up the, 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 the name of Wells, but they were very well known in, 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 in the world, so they made tin toys. There was one of these. Um, it's not made, uh, they're called entrepreneurs, uh, I think, but um, I have other names that, uh, <laughs> for some of them, right? I have the rules, eh? And um, I was like, I stayed with them for 22, 22 years. I'll, I'll just cut it short there, but yeah. So then we, we, we you know, we, had, we were earn, earning money by selling the books very cheaply, uh, and we were, we were actually paying printers to print them. Um, but we came to a point where we were running out of money um, and um, technology takes over now. That We now start to publish electronically and the first one we did was The Road to Jeremy's Ferry, um, which was done on a £200 regeneration grant by one of our members, one of our former members, who interviewed where she lived, about 20, 30 people, uh, and put together The Road to Jeremy's Ferry, the Lee Bridge Road, if you know that bit of London. Is, is the bridge, is Jeremy. it was a ferry before it was a bridge. And the, then the second one was, um, and this is interesting in terms of the history of Heritage Lottery Fund, um, in that um, we used oral history uh, as part of an application for a um, park um,
project, not as not in its own right, but it actually I think persuaded the uh, the um, uh, grants officer uh, because he 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 kept mentioning how impressed he was with the oral history as part of the bid. Um, unfortunately. It's always the way with oral history. If you've been involved in oral history as a, a subsidiary part of a, of a project, it, it, it got just you know, the, the architect, the landscape architect, took it took over, and no oral history is actually in the park, or you know, there was, it was just forgotten. It was part of the bid, but it wasn't part of the project. Unfortunately, it's not the first time, not the last time. Um, again, more one one actually one. Is not an electronic boat spillet, some letters home was, was about, um, it's, not, it's not actually Wolfram Forest, it's about Dagenham. Um, one of our members had been a teacher in Dagenham during the war, and um, two days before war broke out, Dagenham, amazingly, wasn't in a war zone. Um, Falls of Dagenham? Uh, do you think the Germans would bomb it? Uh, possibly. Uh, so that two days before war broke out, they commandeered um, paddle steamers. Um, to take them from Dagenham Dock to Norfolk, and then they had to tout themselves round all the Norfolk villages around Cromer uh, to find um, places to uh, billet, um, because there, there was nothing worked out. Um, so that's an interesting story. We went up to Norfolk to in interview the people who'd actually uh, um, uh, taken the people in, uh, around uh, Runton, I think it was, Runton, yeah. yeah. Um, so an interesting little project outside the borough, oh dear. Um, and then Brandon Road leads to Stocksfield Road. That was a project around um, a neighbourhood study whereby um, a, a settled community was a uh, clearance area, but rather than clear them away, which is what often happened to local communities, they were moved all over the place while they knocked down the houses and rebuilt. They knocked down half the houses, moved the people from the other half into the first half, uh, and then knocked down their houses and built them. So there were two blocks with conflicting um, populations, one of which was settled there for 50, 60 years, and the other one was brand new. So we recorded those stories about the newcomers and the old people and how they got on with each other through the Tenants Association. Um, and behind the bar, um, this is an ongoing thing of a study of the licence trade in the borough, um, and there's a lot of, if anybody's studied the license, licensing tra license trade pubs, there's a massive amount of um, documentation in, in terms of controlling drinking. Um, so that's, that's now 450 pages long, that online book. Um, more recently, we've been, this, this in fact is, is a photograph of Vestry House Museum, our local museum, where our archive is kept. Um, they um, set up a sort of a temporary exhibition area um, and we've been involved in um, working with the museum. They, we work together on exhibitions. Um, sometimes we do the exhibition, sometimes they ask us to do some of the sound edits and they'll use some of our quotes in, in the exhibition. Uh, there's, two, there's two here. Um, Transformer Lives, um, that's the story of a former Hawker Siddeley Power Transformers factory. Transformers and tap changes. Um, technology defeats me on that, but um, that is a the, 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 the photo. Sorry, I'm looking at that one. Um, the, the large photograph there is is a transformer. Um, the one of the last big transformers was used in the Channel Channel rail link. Um, on this side, the French supplied their own transformers, so they weren't. They were only allowed to do the English British side. The French did their own transformer, and there's um, in fact. Interesting that we, we got a 92-year-old 92, former photographer, Albert Bale, who, when he died, he died sadly soon afterwards, after he was interviewed, but his daughter donated all his photographs um, to the museum. And there's this lovely photograph of three lads, one of whom, I can't remember which one it was, it wasn't one of my sort of projects I was involved in, um, was interviewed. And the second one there is Waltham So High Street, well, supposedly the snobbish street market in Europe, um, although it's probably a bit less so now. As street markets tend to, certainly in, in London, <coughs> excuse me, London um, tend to be a bit um, ragged, raggedy piggedy. Um, but we, we, we reused um, interviews done sort of 15, 20 years previously um, because. The, the you know shopping and the, the the high street was was very very important to many people in not just Walthamstow but surrounding areas. 
But we also interviewed some, we also did some new interviews, which is good. And I interviewed the, the, the um, town centre manager and the director of planning for Waltham Forest, a former, both of them former, um, because they could talk more um, lucidly about what they did and didn't do around sort of developing the high street. Outings um, um, was, sorry, behind the bar, that was a, a, a result of the, um, the, the book and the, the interviews that was supposed to be, a, well, it was a collaboration between local history societies in Waltham Forest. We all did panels, um, separate panels, and then interspersed them with um, quotes. Um, and the most recent one, which is on at the moment at the Vestry House, is about toys, toy making, um, in that's Britain's, um, which is um, well, no longer existing. It, it went up to Nottingham in 1992. But I, I've, I'm, I, in fact, I'm still interviewing him. Bill Reagan, who's the company's secretary of Britain's, um, talking about how you made a toy. You've got, 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 got to come up with a, a, a first-class first drawing, drawing of the thing. thing. That would take some, some research, research into the, the books, books and maybe, maybe to go down to the horse cars museum and whatever, and have, have, a have a chat. chat. This would charge the vehicles, good and that sort of thing. thing. And maybe, maybe there's hard and the ones who are the other designers. They wouldn't need involved and they would actually make a drawing. Then you've got to actually look at it to see how that drawing can actually translate into being a toy. What what do you have to have on it? Can't have every invention, I don't think. I think they do a pretty good job. So they do a good job. Then someone makes a model, an actual plasticine model, at twice the size of the model you see there. It's at twice the size. That is then Chapel Cameron, a couple of his first names. He was supposed to do the model modeling. And that model would produce at twice the size. Then go to a tour maker, and they might have a bad character. They would um, outline, outline the model, model on the patch pack machine and the, 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 the model would reduce it in the, the, the half size scale, scale. Uh, which they would spend, spend more, I don't know. Yeah. I can't remember how much a model would cost on a figure like that. I wish I had those details now. But we're talking about oh, two or three thousand pounds per model. Something like a tractor, when we did that, that the cost would be somewhere between 50 and 100,000 pounds just for the moulds alone and the initial origination of it. So that's a lot of money spent up front to produce a toy. Finally, um, strengths and weaknesses. Um, I'll, you, you, I'll, the strengths are self evident in, in, in what, we've, what we've collected. Um, the weaknesses, let's, let's concentrate on the weaknesses. You could, you could hear the the poor quality sound, so, so that's a problem, although you can still hear them, um, thankfully. Um, we've, we're way behind on our digitising, um, and tapes do snap. This is what we've, we're finding, is the tapes snap. Um, a bit of sellotape, that's not, a, not disastrous, but, but they do need rescuing. Um, the, we, we need to be, if somebody is doing research, we, we've... It's not just about ownership of these recordings, but if we, because, of, because when we, we have to find them for people, we have to then go into the museum and, and hand them over, whether they're copies or, or summaries or transcripts or whatever, we have to be actively involved in research. Um, a lot of stuff is not online, um, and I haven't got enough time to go into reasons for what, but we've, we've made a decision that we won't put whole recordings online for, for technical and ideological reasons really. Um, the early paperwork is, is that, <laughs> so it's handwritten notes, so um, it's what you're scanning it in. We, we're scanning it in as a, as, as a PDF, uh, as a stopgap for now. Um, and as Joanna says, a lot of it is still very, very white. Um, a lot of the interviewees, vast, 96% 90, of the interviewees are white, British, we do actually have a collection of about 20 African-Caribbean recordings that was done by a student in the 1990s. And we do collect now, as, as we do, you know, we tend to get people in a more multicultural sense, but we're still very, very white. Um, so th those, those are some of, the, some of the sort of problems of actually accessing um, our recordings. It's, 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 it does need a bit of effort on our part, not just the researchers' part. Um, and there are massive gaps, I'm sure, in, in, in what, what we've collected. Um, but not to, not to sort of be too negative, because there's, there's, there's that whole 
range of very, very good, high quality, 650, by the way, recordings that are, that are, are there um, as, as, as soon as we can actually digitise them there for eternity, hopefully. Um, and that's the end of my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was really interesting. And certainly speaking from somebody who's been using some of these archives, it's so lovely to hear about how they've been created and to be more aware of that context, really, and some of those challenges. So thank you both to Jane and, and Robert. I realise that we, we, we haven't actually had time for questions at the end of presentations. I, I, I don't think David or I wanted to cut people off because it's been so interesting. But we will be having a panel after Julia's presentation when there will be a chance for some from questions then. So there, there will be a chance. For some. So I've introduced Julia, who you've already met this morning, um, going to be talking about the Ambleside and how we've been using it. Uh, uh, I, I shall be briefer because our piece of work is rather small and contained at the moment. But just to tell you a joke to start with, I hope you find it funny. You've probably all heard it, but every time I switch on Radio 4, I hear it. It's a trailer for a programme, and it reminded me of Graham Smith's talk this morning, and the, the, the voice, I think it's um, some um, comedian anyway, and he says, no, I'm not trying to um, back up the internet, I'm trying to print it out. <laughs> And I just, every time I hear it, it makes me laugh. Because it kind of relieves the panic we all feel about all this data out there and all this information. And it's all outside our control. Anyway, to, to, to the business. Um, so we've been doing a little bit of work with some of the interviews of the um, Ambleside Oral History Archive. And I'm not quite sure, but Jane and David will tell us whether this is actually in the vicinity uh, of the interviews that we focused on. But it gives you an idea of the terrain. And it's from the Ambleside Rural History Archive. It is. Oh, good. Um, so what I'm going to talk about is, um, because in this novella, um, Abigail told us a, a bit at the beginning about our kind of where we sit in a program of research. We've been focusing on food and how food features in, um, in, in particular kinds of data sets, existing data sets. Um, so I'm going to look at um, the kinds of ways in which in the interviews we looked at um, we found references to food. And then I'm going to talk about some of the methodological um, issues that um, come up in uh, analysing these data. So we chose the Ambleside Oral History Archive, apart from the fact that we were recommended, uh, it was recommended to us, um, because of its, as we've heard, online accessibility, the search terms, the fact it had all these um, very useful um, descriptions at the beginning of um, particular themes that were covered, um, and, and it very high quality of its provenance and quality control. Um, we also found that there were a substantial number of interviews for the period in which we were interested, which was people born around the turn of the 19th, early 20th century. And we also saw that in the search terms and descriptions of themes, there were a number of references to food. So we selected 26 interviews, and we... Um, when we looked at them, we began to see that a lot of these people concentrated, uh, were concentrated around the valleys of Langdale, or Little Langdale and Greater Langdale, as they refer to it in the Lake District, which at the time was an extremely remote area. Um, just um, a few features of this, that you know, the area has peaks of um, over 2,000 feet, Travel at that time was by bike, horse, or cart. Um, employment work for men was um, mainly the local gunpowder works or slate quarrying. Um, the whole um, paid and unpaid work was highly gendered. 
Men had no paid holidays apart from Langdale Gala and Christmas Day and Good Friday. Uh, and people did, some of them had worked small farms, but they, were, they just had a few sheep, hens, and during the World War I, um, some of them farmed a small crop, crop of oats. Um, as Jane has said, Maine's utilities came very late to the area, um, and um, no tractors, uh, and similarly, there were no tractors until really quite late on, until the 30s or even later, I think, as you will see a picture on the front of the programme. And nearly everyone left school at 14. It was difficult to get to the grammar school, you had to pay, um, and you, your income was expected, as of working class children generally. Um, and children typically helped out on the land during the school holidays. Um, the th one of the themes that comes out very strongly in the interviews centered, focuses on food and food production. The harvesting of potatoes um, with a horse and cart, and, and Mary talks about that, how when she was 12, and a cousin in the family who was living with them was killed in the First World War. Um, she said it was hard work finding anybody to work after that. So she did it. Um, she also milked, made buttermilk, churned butter, she said when she was only six, and learnt the farming practices. Um, two siblings described how their mother used a ten-stone bag of flour um, in a great bin with a lid on that lasted a month. The bread was called haver bread and made of oats and baked in a great flat iron stove, sorry about the accent, um, that was stoked with bracken. Um, this pair of siblings also described killing the pig and um, using it for macon, salted meat, or I don't know if you call it macon, black pudding sausage and all the fat rendered down for lard. Hannah said, I love killing the pig and making sausages and black pudding and lard and everything. I think it was great. <laughs> and another theme was um, they talked a little bit about meal times. Um, and they were fairly positive about the diet in the countryside and talked about you know, eating good plain food and the odd rabbit and sheep. As one of them said, we always ate rough, rough but good. And Meals focused on the men's working day. And Margaret, who's living on a farm, described taking the tea and cake in a tin with a lid on to the men in the fields below the farm, and then coming home to have their um, meal together later. Supper would be around six or seven, depending on daylight. And Margaret said, mother had a hard life. She was always baking and making food. Um, and when 14-year-olds left school, it wasn't at all uncommon and carried on for quite a long time um, for, for the young men to go to hiring fairs where the farmers would bid for their labour. And um, then they would go away and live on the farm. And um, Harry... Uh, was hired at a hiring fair and he just said well that's where you did it all that's where you went that's all there was for hire and he described the unappetizing and unattractive eating facilities served to the hired labor in this next quote and he said we would be working from six in the morning till eight milking eight o'clock at night and it was funny for meals, morning you got porridge, then you got dog head porridge. They used to tip all to meal into a great pan on top of old fire and never stir it. And it used to come up like dumplings. Well, when you broke in, eat into them, they were dry. So they called them dog eats. So that was, that was his experience. He said he, it was a hot spot, but, or, um, and he, he moved on quite fast. Another theme was um, self-sufficiency. Um, we looked for references to difficulties in getting food during World War I, um, and rationing came in somewhat later in that period. Um, but it didn't come up very often. 
But Dorothy, who was the daughter of a local primary school headmaster, um, talked about it a bit. Um, and she said that those who had some land were clearly more self-sufficient, as you'd expect, than those who lived in the town. And she said, and, and there were certain great disadvantages in the war. Well, there was no rationing to begin with. Things were very difficult. In the country, we had much the best of it because the farmers were allowed to butcher their own cattle and you could always get somebody to give you a rabbit if you were short of meat. We kept hens and ducks ourselves. People who stayed with us, this is in the country, um, who came from the town, always went home with a gift from the country when they came. And we have a funny family story about my eldest sister who was getting rather cross with an aunt um, when she was staying with us and said when she was a very young child one morning, kill an old hen and get away home. Um, quite a lot of references are made to food in the context of celebratory occasions. Um, and celebrations um, are obviously part of the annual cycle of country life, of, of life in general, I suppose. Uh, and in people's memories, as um, um, Raphael and Thompson say, are um, their memories sometimes achieve the mythical status of little treasure trove stories that mark the contrast with mundane, everyday lives. Um, special foods were reserved for um, these occasions, which are not eaten at other times of the year, and mention was made of currant pasty on Christmas morning, um, which I gather is a sort of forerunner or equivalent of Christmas pudding, rum puff butter at christenings and feg sow, fig soup, I imagine they were dried figs, for funerals, and Easter ledges, um, Easter ledges being some kind of mix of young nettles, blackcurrant leaves, barley and eggs. And you always have them when things is new and young. Um, and um, there were mentions of these community occasions that um, Jane mentioned, um, chilling hops in the community hall, which were followed by good suppers with ham or salmon. So some of the things that we can learn from looking for references to food um, concern the centrality of food, but also food production in sustaining a rural way of life. Um, secondly, the way uh, food is embedded in ordinary, everyday uh, lives um, is part and parcel of it and is therefore only mentioned quite often en passant. Um, and moreover, I think the, the way in which looking back at the past, and, and these interviews, these interviewees were looking back at the past, um, they're looking back, um, and I'll say more about this, um, in the context of what's gone on in, the, in the, uh, changes in, in more than a century. And they also tell us about the high, point, high, the high points that mark the calendar of rural life in a remote area. So to the methodological issues, which really were what we were about in this research, because the whole of Novella is, um, is you know, the, the whole of the National Research Centre for Methods is about um, methodological um, kind of development and, and skilling and capacity building. So, what kinds of limitations to, uh, did we have when we started to use these data? I mean, first and most obviously, we were not involved in the original study or data collection. We only accessed the transcripts and we didn't listen to the tapes, although I gather they are available. Um, our purposes of analysis were not they were very specific, they were not those um, of the original um, collectors of the data. We were looking at food, which is one tiny bit of all of this material. And 
We were also distanced in time. I mean, this is over 100 years on um, in some cases. We're very distanced in terms of the area, um, had no knowledge of it firsthand, um, and certainly no intimate knowledge of, of rural life, I think, between, you could say, between any of us, um, it, it was certainly in uh, rural Cumbria. Um, and we're ourselves situated in a particular environment, tra tradition, social science, not history, and in an academic context. So I now want to turn to some of the particular aspects of the material that I think is worth making some comments about. The first is that the material that we had available, the transcripts, are very much in dialogic form. They're interviewer talking to interviewee. They're very much conversations. Certainly these early interviews, they're not actually live stories. And all we have is what goes on in the interview, obviously. And the missing data is what's gone on off tape, um, um, how people were persuaded, what was said to them, and so on and so forth. Um, but also, we don't know the parameters of the interview. You know, what was the agreement in terms of time and the person and their, you know, ability or, or desire to be interviewed for, for long periods of time. Um, and um, in, in reading these transcripts, I think what 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 was clear to us is that um, the interviewers had, um, because perhaps of the uh, longevity of the, of the interviewees and the um, changes that have happened in that part of the world, they're interested in cultural material practices, which indeed is what we were interested in, not so much in the individuals per se. Um, and this brings me on to my next point. And certainly in, in these 26 interviews, it's quite... Um, quite uh, often the case that the interviewer is drawing on and demonstrating to the interviewee, working quite hard at it to show their insider knowledge of the community. I mean, in part, I suppose that would be, it's not to impress, but it's to draw out to get confirmation of, of, um, of what they've already learned from doing other interviews. Uh, and to see if people can add to it, even refute it, because stor you know, stories are told and then you know, sometimes they don't make sense or you, know, you wonder. And, and so there's quite an interchange. It's quite a di dialogic type of interview. Um, another thing which I found quite striking in the interviews, um, in some of them, and in a way this is totally obvious, but it, sometimes it's very much the interviewer and the interviewee talk in what Basil Bernstein refers to, referred to as, the uh, as a restricted communicative code, by which I mean that people are um, not spelling out. The interviewer is not saying, oh, was that the schoolmaster? Was that um, the farm next to the one down the road? People talk in names, and for the, for, the, for the user of the data, this is quite often completely mysterious. You know, I don't know whether it's a cottage, a household, um, a style, or what it is. So you have to, you, have to, you know, it's difficult to work out and you need other information. Also, distances, you know, if you're walking to Ambleside, you've really don't know which route or how long it would take unless you'd walk the terrain yourself. Um, Jane referred to temporality, uh, and that's, um, that's the key feature of narrative material, which is what we were in, which is what we're looking at. We're talking about people's um, not big stories necessarily, but small stories, the way people talk. We're looking at textual material. Um, and how, what they tell, one of the things that is striking, although they don't tell 
very kind of co coherent or present themselves as telling their lives, talking about the whole of their lives, they do tell um, what um, Anne back talks about and Bamberg, small stories. Um, for example, um, one person talked about uh, the idiosyncratic dress of a famous local inhabitant called Mrs. Helis, who's actually Beatrix Potter, and, and said, aye, well, it was always a rough brat. It was a sack that had been cut and a tape put on. And even though, like since her books are worth a fortune, she was like an old tramp, really. It was all you could say about her, but she was a great old lass. So these little stories crop up from time to time. And as Jane also said, the interviewees, these, these, this oldest generation, very much focused on their early lives. Their memories of childhood are clear. And we were also interested in, particularly in around the First World War, but we found that people didn't refer very much to history, to particular historical, grand, or political, or events as such. Time is ordered by their life course, by the dramatic local crises, like <coughs> the blowing up of the local, not blowing up, the, the accident with the local gunpowder factory, and regular events in the community calendar, like hiring fairs, top fairs, which I, I think now I'm living partly in the country, is something to do with selling of the male young sheep, if I'm right, any nodding going on, and the Langdale Gala. So, um, and lastly on this slide, the interviewees dwell on how the routines and rituals of their everyday country life have disappeared in the context, of course, they're not saying this necessarily, but of a changed society. And, and to some extent, that can be sometimes an artefact of the interviewer's questions, because, um, yes, this looks, this is a very different, different world, or tell me about that, um, in, in, in a way that makes them kind of contrast the past and the present. So temporality, then, is not only what you recall, it's how you recall it. And um, you recall the past from the vantage point of the present. Um, and um, as you can see from this next quote um, from Hannah, um, She's very much, it's implicit, it's not very explicit, but there is an implicit sense in which she's talking about the past, but saying it to you as an interviewer in the present. We were fairly well fed and well clothed at the time within reason for those days you see, and having your own milk, and this is a good thing for children, isn't it? So, you know, she's saying, well, yes, having milk is still a good thing. You will agree with that even now. So she doesn't want to judge the past in a negative way. On the other hand, the past is um, constructed as a foreign land in the context of rapid technological and other changes. And as Jane hinted and said, um, it can be seen through rose-tinted spectacles um, and also it can be uh, seen negatively. Um, and um, have an example of, um, how am I doing for time? I've got the watch, right, <laughs> I'm okay, I think just about. Um, Mrs. McCran talked about the past positively and saying how, you know, they live very simply compared you know, implicitly, she was comparing it with the complexity of the current food chain. She said, I think we all lived very much more simply than people live today. I mean, we were all pretty well self-supporting from the point of view of garden produce and chickens, and my father kept pigs, and so. And the past is also constructed negatively, and Albert and his friend Jim and this is back in the late 1970s when he was interviewed, um, were um, 
the Lake District was, was then a very changed place. The quarries had closed, the buildings were no longer being constructed out of solid stone, um, the, the, some of the land was covered with bracken, the ditches and drains were left unblocked, um, and stone walling was disappearing. Um, so Albert bemoans, um, uh, he's, a, he's a builder, and he bemoans the re as ridiculous the current cost of repairing buildings um, and the heavy lorries that are on the roads of the Lake District today. He, he, doesn't, he talks about Walter, I'm not quite sure who Walter was, but he said, I don't know about what Walter would say now if he saw these lorries going round now with 30 tonne on. They would get a shock, a lot of them, if they come back again, wouldn't they? And my last uh, theme is to talk about um, performativity, which I've tried to give you a sense of already. There's quite a lot, there's a sort of dramatic quality of a lot of the talk. Um, and I think that's what fascinates me about oral history, really. It's a sort of... Um, it's the theatrical <laughs> aspects of it. And, and, you know, not to forget that people are talking um, with the interviewer in mind um, as well as um, for their own purposes, which we should never forget as well. And they employ narrative skills and narrative devices. Um, they're very specific in their references to places and people, and so forth, they tell these small stories. They often use direct speech. He said, I said, and so on. And very importantly, they um, deploy humour. Um, and they, all these methods uh, draw in the listener to, um, to, so that makes you want to hear more. And they're very keen to hold their audience. And um, I think I'll just end with this rather funny story, I think. Uh, Albert recounted a story about the lack of, you know, transportation for moving animals around the place and how he walked a cow all the way from Keswick to Langdale. And I've quite forgotten how long that is, but it's quite a way. And the story sort of shows these performative aspects um, and the way... It, it also refers a little bit to food. Um, the drama of the occasion is heightened by the way the two lads in this next bit rashly spend what at the time was clearly quite a, bit of, quite a lot of money on cake. And the story is also a moral tale. Um, the, the cake makes the boys feel sick, and they get, so they get their just desserts. And the two men look back fondly on this kind of rather funny but foolish um, time in their childhood. And it, I'll try really hard with this quick. I put the, this halter on this cow, brought it out of cow shed, got away, and it rushed off into the vicar's garden, ploughed up two or three flower beds, threw its head amongst the rose bushes before I got it caught. Anyway, we walked down out of gate quite quick and set off and poor beggar laid down in Tullet Nest. Aye, and we got a good feed at Grasmere. Oh yes, we called at a confectioner's shop and got half a crown's worth of cake, and what a bag full we got for half a crown in them days. And me and George ate cakes until we were about sick. And we finished them off in Hullet Nest when cow laid down, cow laid down to have a rest, and we finished our cake. But well, if that's not a dramatic telling, I mean, I don't mean mine, I mean his telling for the story. I don't know what is. Um, so, as reusers of, a da of data, there are many things to say. Um, and, um, and I think one of the things is about interpretation. There are many interpretations that we could, we could make. We're always in the moment of analysing, if you like. And <laughs> when I was crushed up against some young man in the tube this morning. I couldn't, I, as one does, I read his slides that he was about to <laughs> present on his way to some conference, I suppose. And on this slide, it was amazing, it had translation, fidelity to the primary source. 
And then underneath it said, Transcreation, Fidelity to the Secondary Source. And I, I puzzled all the way. And I thought, yes, are we in both? Are we, we're both translating, trying to be true to our, to, to, to the, to, to what the interviewees say, to our data and to the context and so forth. But in this impact world, we're also trans-creating. That is the secondary thing. And I, I, I have no idea. I, I rather suspect it was a computer program or something. <laughs> but anyway, so um, the points I was going to make was, one, it's difficult for as outsiders um, to make sense of data which we didn't collect. Um, the second point, I think, is that it's quite hard, and if you're not a historian, to set accounts within local and broader historical context. There's a sort of limit to how, his, you know, to our, perhaps the social scientists, we can't all be historians. Um, issues of second selective recall, I won't talk about. Um, the, um, and... I suppose, you know, because we've been doing, looking at the narrative aspects of the data, um, trying to be clear about whether we are um, mainly interested in what really happened in the past, or are we, and are we, interested in how people sent, make sense of the past and of their lives. And maybe we're in trying to do both quite often. Um, and this point I've already talked at length about, about um, valuations of the past are, are made in the context of the present. But I do feel, and I think and my colleague um, Abigail worked, uh, we, we worked together on this, um, these data uh, bring, us to, bring us closer to a particular time and to a very particular place. Thank you. <laughs>